Today, together, we're going to try and break into your mind and find something new, something special. Now, hopefully, you'll get to experience a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of that, <laughs> for sure. We've got to get that going on. Um, now, let's get stuck into it. Firstly, thank you guys again for coming here and attending. For, it's a great privilege to speak in front of you. We're at, we're at Defrost. That's really cool. So um, I applaud you for being proactive and for investing your time. Feel free to use your devices, take notes, take photos. Um, all of that's welcome. Join the conversation on Twitter and Instagram. Hashtag birth of a designer. My handle is at the giant thinker. A show of hands real quick here. Who is an emerging designer? Maybe students or recent graduates? A couple of you, most of you, awesome. Uh, three years and under experience. A couple of you guys, awesome. Five years, we've got any five year, year guys here, awesome. Ten? Ten? Nice. It's like a bidding sort of like, we're auctioning off something. Um, 25 years, 30? Vince, Vince will be watching, so that was, was for him. <laughs> now, I'm here to talk to you about the birth of a designer. Uh, the process behind a designer's emergence and how to get a job as one. For those uh, established designers, I hope that this will be a little reminder as to uh, the gift that we hold in our hands, the ability to design. Who here believes that certain people are just born as designers, as if it were written in the stars or part of one's molecular genetic makeup? Anybody? Good. That was the right answer, not to say anything. Um, because not unless you actually came out of an iMac and you had Creative Cloud installed, then it's highly unlikely that you were just born as a designer. Um, being whoever you want to be is indeed a decision. If we look at the characteristics of all humans, we're all naturally curious. We appreciate all forms of communication. We embrace innovation. We seek simpler and better ways of understanding the world around us, and we know that creativity speaks volume so much so that we're inclined to respond to that creation in some way or another. And uh, even though we all share these traits, those of us that further interrogate, investigate, and explore the world visually and conceptually are indeed the ones who emerge as designers. They feel a deep need to understand how communication works at an almost obsessive level. They often draw, some, not all, they read, they experiment, they make things. They participate in culture and really get into the thick of it by observing the work of others and creating work themselves. Some of you are realizing this now or have realized this in your own personal journey. In preparation for this talk, I asked myself, what were these moments for me? What were the early habits that nurtured my design abilities? Here is a painting I did when I was nine years old for the Ride School City Art Prize. Uh, the, the theme was recycling, uh, and I would enter competitions like these because I would often get certificates like these. And although the same day I dug this up uh, was the same day I watched a, a TED talk by a, a boy named Thomas Suarez, who is a 12-year-old app developer, so you can have a mental note there, but he definitely brought me back down to earth. Here is a drawing I did when I was uh, four years old in kindergarten. And here is an image of my attempt 10 years later at 14. There you go. Uh, that's probably all I've got on Thomas. I do, however, have a book that I made with my bare hands uh, about the health benefits of milk. It's saddle stitched with wool woolen string. I would have been about eight years old when I did this one. And uh, there's an inside look at it there. You can get milk from camels as well as cows. Did you know that? Um, apparently I did when I was eight. Fun fact. Uh, I've even got monsters endorsing the milk. There you go. They're loving it. Uh, and then I started to continue to draw and experiment with different mediums as I grew older into high school. Here's a few portraits there of some friends. And then I wanted to experiment with wood panels and painting and I really enjoyed that, that type of thing. There's a few there. And then I wanted to fuse drawing with textured vector graphics as I started to get more into designing on the computer. So there's an example for you there. And then I investigated vector art a little bit more, and then a little bit more again. 
Uh, this particular one uh, actually surprisingly won at the People's Choice Award for a, at an art gallery in, in Sydney many, many years ago. Um, so that was, that was really overwhelming. So growing up, I remember receiving the same reaction from teachers, family members and friends. Every time I would make something, it would always be positively received, like many of you, I'm sure. From a young age, it makes all of us feel like we're, we're doing something good, something right. I would, however, think to myself it's just a drawing or a cave made out of blankets and pillows, also known as my bedroom. Um, but as I entered high school, I started to form a deeper understanding of that reaction. And I realised that it was the moment that I spoke to people without ever making a sound. And as Bill and Ted once said, dude, are you sure we should be doing this? Ted, you and I uh, witnessed many things, but nothing as bodacious as what just happened. Being a designer is indeed a special responsibility. Uh, perhaps not as much as this guy, but I would like to think equally as special. Because I then started to think, imagine doing this every single day and getting paid for it. And imagine doing this on a larger scale where I could speak to millions of people. Well, it took me over 10 years, but it finally happened. One of the projects I was privileged enough to art direct and design is called Thanks a Million, and it was a campaign for Telstra. Um, now, basically for this brief, Telstra, Telstra's customers weren't happy basically. Um, there were too many detractors and not enough advocates. The entire company needed to revolutionise the way it connected with customers. So a new level of recognition and care was delivered by a simple thank you. Through highly targeted DMs, EDMs and even personal calls, we even got um, some celebrities involved, and over 72,000 data variables were used to bring empathy and authenticity to the message. The result was that over six million people were thanked individually within Australia. And that project uh, took five months collaboratively with a great agency called Lavender. And I found that communicating at that scale was as rewarding as I envisioned. The chair on top was that it was chosen as last year's winner for data strategy in the Australian Creativity and Effectiveness Awards. But it wasn't always blue skies and rainbows. I had many failures and disappointments along the way. 15 was an interesting age for me. It was at that age that my mother got sick and she couldn't work for almost two years. And it was around that time that I got rejected for grade 10 work experience. I called 99 agencies and only uh, one of them eventually on the 100th call uh, let me in. And it was also at that time that I visited this place for the first time, uh, the Philippines. One of the moments that's tattooed in my memory was walking out of Manila Airport. I was decked out in my billabong and quicksilver gear at the time. And uh, I walked out and a Filipino boy just uh, was walking with me. He just appeared out of nowhere and he was selling me a floral handmade necklace. And my grandmother said, do not give any money to the beggars, right? And I said, that's easy, that's fine. But beggars to me were old men with, with um, massive beards, wizard-like and just like sitting on a street corner uh, with a cardboard sign. Um, Little did I know that there were hundreds of beggars in the area. As I give the boy 20 pesos, which is uh, about 50 cents, it was as if I opened the door to a free One Direction concert in the car park. There were kids everywhere. They just scrambled asking, it was like the pigeon effect. So I run to the designated van and shut the door and my grandmother says, see, I told you. Um, so of course it was moments like these that really shaped my attitude and, and work ethics. After high school, I was offered a scholarship to study graphic design at a private college. It was a pretty gruelling uh, four-part interview process, but it was worth it. However, even though I completed the course, it still didn't guarantee me a job, not even close. I actually took a role in the mailroom at a well-known advertising agency called Ogilvy & Mather because I knew it was, uh, was difficult to get your foot in the door. But I was really happy to start at the bottom because I knew that uh, the, the currency of networking was on the back of my mind and it, it all panned out. 350 people I met within the first week um, and the cultural exposure that I had in that place um, became the springboard to launch my entire career. To date, I've been fortunate enough to have worked for some of the biggest uh, agencies in the world, including DDB, Imagination, McCann, World Group, for clients such as Audi, Google, McDonald's, Combank, Bonds and Louis Vuitton. 
So that's how it began with me. Around three years ago, I, I, I started to get emails from the design community and people from all over the world asking me for advice on how to get a job as a designer. So I was really active online with, all, with, with the social community. And as I would answer these questions, I started to repeat myself. So in 2012, I started the blog giantthinkers.com to reach a broader audience in one hit. Three months later, it got picked up by Howe Magazine, Communication Arts Magazine, and the American Institute of Graphic Arts. I also launched a podcast recently as part of the blog, and um, I interviewed Vince on there, so definitely have a listen if you haven't already. This all leads me to here and now. As some of you may know, I uh, wrote a book in August last year. I launched that, and then I did a three-month speaking tour around the States uh, in America, where I did 22 cities within three months, over November, December, and January. I engaged with over 10,000 people and also delivered two classes in creativelive.com in San Francisco. Now, before we examine the burning question, how do you get a job as a designer, we must first ask, why do you want to get a job as a designer? By asking why, we have purpose. And when we have purpose, we, of course, have direction. So make sure you define your reason. Design itself was, of course, born well before we even called it that. Uh, as we know in its diluted form, its sole purpose is to visually communicate while simultaneously solving a human-centered problem. But this form of communication is changing at a rapid rate. Take a look at these ancient cave paintings on the left where they use their hands as a stencil, but still use the spray painting technique except blowing paint mixture from their mouth to the wall as opposed to what we now know as spray cans. And the right there is, of course, one of Banksy's artworks. If we look at this tribal warrior from Kenya, the body art design and face painting is a huge part of a way that they pay homage to their um, spirituality and their expression of their beliefs. In the Western world, we also have this. They're called onesies, um, commonly worn in celebrations such as ha Halloween's, birthday parties, or just snip snipping out and ducking into 7-Eleven for a quick Cornetto, which I saw the other day. The evolution of lettering to literature to the power of a single logo. Take the branding design of McDonald's, for instance. The golden arches are universally known without any language barriers. Plus, uh, this leads us to our interpretation of icons, symbols, pictograms. It's becoming clearer, more immediate. The left are very abstract, and you wouldn't know um, what they are. Uh, but they're ancient interpretations of seasons. But on the right, of course, we know exactly what they are. Plus, the way that we're communicating is also changing, of course, because of technology and engineering. Digital design has overtaken print design, uh, analog phones to smartphones, if you can remember that. Uh, even flying drones like this one from Amazon, where we'll all be receiving deliveries this way soon enough. Plus, wearable technology is on the rise and it's escalating at a rapid rate. So the list goes on. But what does this tell us? It tells us that designers are people that create value in the world. This value is made up of three equal pillars. As a designer, you're a problem solver, you're a visual crafter, and you're a business thinker all in one. But I'd like to take these three pillars and present them to you in a different light. Firstly, you're not the kind of problem solver that turns your underwear inside out because you had no more clean ones to change into. You're really like Sherlock Holmes. He uh, was a fictional detective, and he's known for his astute logical reasoning, his ability to adopt almost any disguise, and his use of forensic science to solve difficult cases. Problem solving in design is an unwavering process of this exact same thing. It's experimentation, exploration, testing, plus hours and hours of research and collaboration. Secondly, you're not the kind of visual crafter that uh, spills spaghetti bolognese on the kitchen floor and leaves it there because you think that the ground looks better like that. You're really like Michelangelo. He's, of course, an Italian sculptor, a painter, an architect, a poet, an engineer, the guy that crafted the Pieta Statue of David, as you know, and this beautiful thing, the Sistine Chapel. You're a designer who is multidisciplined, who is versatile, who has vision, someone who executes at the highest level to communicate with precision and purpose. And thirdly, you're not the kind of business thinker that sells umbrellas in the desert 
when you should probably be selling water. You're really like Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin Group, comprising of over 400 com uh, companies, and started his first company at 16. So remember, the three pillars of a designer are really uh, captured by the characteristics of these three people. Imagine what life would be like without designers, from design thinking through to the design execution. I've collected two short videos that really capture the impact designers are making in our world. I'll just show you a minute of each of them. 3.4 million people die each year from water-related disease. But the even bigger problem? Most of them don't even know that water is unsafe to drink in the first place. That's why Water is Life, partnering with scientists and engineers at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Virginia, set out to invent a solution that solves both of these problems. Introducing The Drinkable Book, the first ever tool that teaches safe water habits and is printed on technologically advanced filter paper capable of killing deadly waterborne diseases. My name is Terry Dinkovich. I am a chemist. I invented a paper that purifies drinking water. After passing water through our filter, we found a reduction of greater than 99.9% .9 in bacteria count, which is comparable to the tap water in this country. The book uses a brand new type of paper that works like a scientific coffee filter. Each piece is coated with silver nanoparticles, which kill diseases like cholera, E. coli, and typhoid. The orange color of the paper is a direct result of the addition of the silver nanoparticles. And at the end of the day, the most important thing, and really the hero of this whole project, is the technology behind it. The book itself works in three easy steps. Simply tear out a filter, slide it into the custom filter box, and pour contaminated water through. What comes out is safe to drink. The content on each page, printed in food grade ink, educates people about safe water habits, things that we take for granted, such as keeping trash and feces away from your water source. But the best part of the book isn't just that it purifies water or teaches proper sanitation, it's the fact that this filter paper will revolutionize water purification. It costs only pennies to produce, making it by far the cheapest option on the market, and it's extremely sustainable. Each filter is capable of giving someone up to 30 days worth of clean water, and each book is capable of providing someone with clean water for up to four years. To learn how you can provide a filter book for a community in need, head to waterislife.com. So, the biggest problem is this. What came first? It's quite similar to the dilemma that you need experience uh, to get a job, but you need a job to get experience. The fact is that there are only a small amount of jobs available versus the massive amount of graduates that are coming through the gates every year. But it's always been competitive. So what does it mean? Should we pursue a different career path or panic? Definitely not especially if you're passionate about it. Instead, we need to leverage uh, all of this and see it as an opportunity to grow and expand into the new territories within the three pillars mentioned earlier. Albert Einstein once said that we can't solve a problem while we're in the same level of thinking that created it. 
So, you and I, we need a new level of thinking. How do we do that? We don't just get it by thinking about it. We need to change the context in which thoughts emerge. The opportunity we have right now is the, is the ability to redefine a designer's purpose. So how do you get a job as a designer? Well, there are only five specific parts you need to develop well. The quality in which you execute these five parts uh, will dictate the quality of employment and more importantly, the lifestyle you will live. The five parts in order are education, design, portfolio, networking, and interviews. Now, although these areas aren't anything new to you, what I will be doing is um, pulling apart some of these areas in a very top line format. If you have a question, please note it down and I'll be ha happy to answer it afterwards or send me a tweet and I will respond to that. All right, let's get stuck into it. Uh, I'll go straight into the second one on that list, which is design. Now, whether they're assignments, personal projects, paid briefs or dummy briefs, you need to start designing work so that you can begin to think conceptually and learn to use the programs. It also helps to find a mentor to guide you during this time to get uh, constructive criticism and experienced feedback. Now, at this point, I'm going to give you a list of my top five design tips that, in my experience, are the most important areas to consider when designing. For those that have graduated or are, or are designers, hopefully, hopefully these will be great reminders. The first is relevance. Don't be led by aesthetics, be led by relevance. I can't emphasize this point enough. This requires you to adequately research before designing any brief. The more that you know about your communication objectives, the target audience, the culture of the brand, the perceptions of the market and the environment the design will be seen in, the uh, better and clearer your mind will be when making design decisions. Once you start uncovering this information, you can get to the solution quicker because you're informed by the, psycho the psychology of the people that you're speaking to. The next one's pretty straightforward. Uh, whether you stay in the grid or break out of it, you must have one because you need to organize the information in a hierarchy that's easily digestible. Speaking of hierarchy, ask yourself, what is the most important thing I'm trying to say? That single primary message must be crystal clear. The secondary message uh, should then substantiate that initial claim, usually through transparent proof points and, and honest proof points. The third should present a call to action to the audience. Get them to do what it is you want them to do, whether it be calling a button, uh, calling a button, that's weird, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Clicking a button, calling a phone number, um, turning a page, uh, taking up an offer, buying an item, or even just reacting to something as cool as that Pepsi bus shelter. The fourth we're up to, yes, typography. Now this can make or break any design communication piece. It's a craft in itself. Kerning and leading text should become second nature to you and uh, be used with legibility and hierarchy in mind. A shout out to, of course, Vince Frost and everyone at Frost Collective here. Uh, the work that comes out of the doors in this particular place uh, are all exceptional examples of the power of typography. Here are a few of uh, my uh, favorites of, of some that are floating around on the internet. And so typography overall doesn't need to be flat. You're only restricted by your imagination. There's um, many out there that, that you can, um, I'm sure, relate to that really speak to you in your own way. Now, if you can implement the previous four tips, you've got the foundation of a good design, but that's only 50% of it. A truly great design injects those fundamentals with a big idea. A big idea is the springboard into multi-layered conversations. A creative spark that's simple and immediate. You'll know you've done this when you've captured attention, created delight and delivered meaning. Portfolio, okay, moving on to this one. Uh, portfolio creation and development. This and the following two parts are hugely important topics. I uh, cover these in detail in my book as uh, separate chapters, but we'll cover a few key points with the time that we have. This is my definition of, of a portfolio here, and um, it is 
uh, a refined and considered selection of your best work, customized to speak to the area of design that you're applying for. It should showcase your proven abilities, your uh, examples of, of completed work and potential for growth. So let's break this down. Number one here. Your portfolio of work should directly translate to the role that you're applying for. There's no point putting a ton of packaging design and then applying for a digital junior design role when they've specifically asked for UX, UI um, designs, wireframes, landing pages, EDMs, all that type of stuff. This seems obvious, however, you'll be surprised how often this point is overlooked. Number two. This is either a disciplinary decision or a categorical decision. What skew is your portfolio going to lean towards? Design to what you love, and if you don't know how, then upskill. And um, what you really need to hone in on is the tools and designing to the behavior of the customer and their device. Number three. You have to photograph your work. I highly recommend you do that um, wherever possible for one main reason, and that is that it looks real. Um, if it isn't a paid client brief, a photograph of the mock-ups will bring your work to life and make it more tangible. If it's digital of, of work, of course, render it in situ uh, on the desktop screens, uh, mobiles, smartphones, and um, iPads, that type of thing. I'll just quickly run through a couple examples of exactly what I said. So, uh, you know, this could be really dull and boring if it was just a flat graphic, but um, it adds depth when you shoot something. It also gives it a sense of scale. This was just a, a dark mailer for ISOWAY for their summer campaign. Um, this was the tra traveling exhibition stand that went with, with that, which um, went across all Westfields across the country. So make sure you, yeah, you photograph those instances when you can. Uh, this was a joint brand, uh, merged branding I did for Crown and Aspinalls in London. Uh, it's a web website job and a rebranding there. And this is for the New South Wales government where they got me on to um, completely redesign a section of their um, department, smart and skilled. So there's a couple examples. So that, I just rendered that. Um, as you know, and uh, this is some packaging design for Interface Floor, They're the world's largest uh, carpet tiling company. And they've got different themes for their samples. And this is for a small company called Soul Color. Uh, they're mood sprays. They don't smell like anything. You just spray it in the air and dive into it. Um, <laughs> and the Swarovski crystals associated with, with their product as well. So how you present your work is equally as important as the work itself. You guys have probably seen this. Um, his name is uh, Justin Gynack. He's a great example of this very point. He's a New York City-based artist and entrepreneur who began selling garbage in 2001 when his co-workers challenged the importance of packaging design. So to prove them wrong, he decided to find something that no one would ever buy, package it, and sell it. So walking around the dirty streets of Times Square, he found that garbage was the perfect answer. And uh, look, he's done pretty well for himself now. 14 years on, he sold over 1,400 cubes. And uh, they live in 30 countries around the world. I tried to get one, so apparently New York ran out of garbage. Um, they go for around 80, 80 bucks, 80 to 120 bucks. Um, so yeah, there you go. Now, I'm not saying to uh, design rubbish and then only uh, focus your energy on how it's presented. What I do advise is that you consider how the work is housed, and this will either help your work shine or be its downfall. Number five here is um, online website options. Now, the main portfolio platform you should have is an online website. Having a printed portfolio and an emailable PDF is fine, but it's, a, it's secondary to a website. Your website should, of course, be responsive and it can be presented in, on a laptop or an iPad during face-to-face -face interviews. Keep it super simple. The less clicks the viewer has to make, the better. A very cheap and quick option is uh, to get you off the ground is to uh, buy one from uh, sites such as themeforest.net where you can get WordPress templates. There's nothing wrong with using a template uh, as a foundation because you should let your work shine and all your energy should be going into that. Um, and, that and it can be quite time consuming if you create a website from scratch, especially a portfolio website in particular. 
Also check out squarespace.com, of course, which has exceptional responsive website options at a small ongoing cost. And some points here that you've just got to remember no matter how you do it, whether you buy one or create one yourself. Uh, make sure it's mobile, responsive, has a user-friendly curating system, has large real estate uh, for viewing images, has well-positioned social media sharing integration, and has a space for your logo in the top header. There are also many free portfolio sites out there if you, ha if you aren't already on them uh, or you've probably stumbled on them, then just at least get onto some of these. The key is to start somewhere. It's never going to be perfect, so don't think that, don't wait for perfection. Um, you're going to continue to develop that as you go. All right. Now, captioning your work. It, your work should, of course, speak for itself, um, but you need to caption it so that you can put your work in context. Here are some of the captions that I recommend. Client, name who the client was for, the work was for. Um, agency, name the company or studio you did the work at. What was the primary objective, the challenge or the opportunity? Uh, role, specify your role. Be transparent of who you worked with as well. And the results are optional. If it did badly, then maybe leave that one out. Now, here are some questions that can help you um, organize your portfolio pieces. Because I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, which one should I keep? Which one should I chuck? Um, you know, so here are some questions that can help you. What are your top five pieces? What is your hero work? Can you group your work into projects to show depth in thinking? Can you expand some pieces even further with additional components? And consider showing your creative process too, or at least keep those documents. All right, let's move on to networking. Now this is purely about building relationships and is by far the most effective job search tool that you can use. It is the answer to the most common question that we brought up earlier about the chicken and the egg. Um, in needing experience first to get a job, networking is the key. It's a currency in itself, as I mentioned before, and you have to look at people as opportunities. There's a chance to meet people everywhere you go, whether it be the person in front of you at the cafe, or uh, regulars at the gym, or new friends at a, at a party or social gathering. Going to industry events like this is very important, of course, but don't limit yourself to that one source. Now, you and LinkedIn are made for each other, and I will tell you why. Here are the, the four powerful reasons why you have to get on it, if you aren't on it already, and if you are, great. Keep, keep uh, being active on there. Number one, the search tool. You can search for people, jobs and companies, and contacting people in one portal makes uh, networking super easy, as well as stalking, um, which um, <laughs> you can uh, do at your own discretion, of course. Newsfeed, keep up to date with articles um, from thought leaders and industry peers. You'll occasionally even have people post job uh, requirements or, or you know that uh, job roles rather directly on there that they need someone right away and an interesting statistic is that about 80% of jobs in the Western world are filled through word of mouth about 20% of jobs are available are only publicly advertised and of course um, Ooh, I'd skip there. Uh, you can get recommendations as well from your peers, which shows credibility and believability of who you are. And at the end of it, you've got your online resume, which you can just point people to. Now, I found that sending emails is the most effective way to get an interview that will ultimately lead to a job. Make sure that uh, you write a personalized email that's honest, short, and engaging enough to cause a response. Big tip here, I mentioned, Personalized. So get personal. Uh, a generic email simply won't cut it. And you need to be open. You need to put yourself on, on a plate and, and be genuine. All right, home stretch now. Interviews. So you've scored an interview, and um, usually it's in a few days' time. Your mind is probably racing and going a million miles an hour. It's natural to be nervous, it's a good thing. This is the way that your body is telling you that this is important to you and that it matters. Use it, embrace it, uh, and focus on how badly you want the job. 
This is how I prepare, which I highly recommend. Test your PDFs, um, or loose PDFs rather, if you have them floating in your computer and you're going to bring your laptop or iPad. Um, ha and have your website um, up, click through that, make sure it's all running correctly. And of course, any images or samples, bring them along. Practice going through your portfolio and answers. Get a good night's sleep before the interview um, and try not to skip breakfast to fuel your body that morning. You've got to get really energized for that and, and stay focused. Aim to arrive in the area um, just to get into that state of mind. You know, just be in the area around 20 minutes early is a good sort of habit. A great strategy that I used to put me in the right frame of mind is to act as if you already know them. Uh, or act as if they're a long friend that you haven't seen in a while. From there, some situational icebreakers that I've used, for example, have been something like, hi Mary, nice to meet you. I really love the rustic look of the place. It actually reminds me of the buildings in Florence. I was, I was just in Europe not too long ago. Or uh, which of the top 30 uh, cafes in the area has your tick of approval? So the point is you need to look at conversations as a nat uh, sorry, interviews as a natural conversation uh, rather than being probed at an episode of Law and Order. Tone of voice. Okay, high-pitched ums, extended ahs, and frequent I don't knows are just some of the vehicles that carry unnecessary tone. Again, when responding to an employer uh, or a potential employer, I suggest speaking as if you already know them. This thought alone has destroyed any anxiety I had before interviews. Look at your body as well as a 30-piece orchestra and the song it creates and the message uh, is the message that you're projecting. Each of your body parts have different parts to play and uh, at different times. You can choose to do, use a subtle instrument or at times uh, a group to build anticipation, maybe bust into a head spin um, to create intrigue. No, don't do that. Um, but you know what I mean, right? You've got to really leverage your body. Don't be stiff as, you know, stiff as a stick. That's, that's not going to work in your favor. So a rundown on some key interaction tips. Breathe, uh, get the blood flowing so you can think clearly. I swear to you, I had a girl at an interview once and she almost passed out because she just forgot to breathe. So, breathe. Smile, uh, not the creepy kind. Think George Clooney or Julia Roberts. Professional, yet warm and pleasant. Uh, relax your shoulders, never fold your arms, avoid slouching, hold eye contact. Again, maybe not too long, not too creepy. Um, Nod when appropriate. Uh, use the subtleties of facial expressions to add to your stories. And take advantage of hand gesturing to create emotion. Point four is to use storytelling to create an emotional connection. If you meet an interesting person, you don't get that perception by them saying to you, hey, I'm interesting. That's, that just never happens. Um, you get that impression of them being interesting by them saying interesting things, right? From their thoughts, from their stories, um, the way that they're sharing their ideas. This very dynamic is the exact same interaction you need to carry across to the interview situation. Now, there are only three questions that you should focus on and prepare for um, during an interview. The majority of interview questions will tie back to these three questions. Now, if you prepare for these three umbrella questions, it means that you can answer most questions more naturally. Here we go. The three umbrella questions are, number one, do you have the experience and expertise to undertake the role? They're going to ask you a bunch of questions here and what they're really digging is for your competence levels. Number two. Do you have the enthusiasm and genuine interest in the role and the agency? What they're looking for here is your attitude, really important. And number three, are you going to fit into the agency's culture and team? What they're looking for in this particular question is what else can you contribute to this place? Now, before the interview wraps up, make sure you uh, ask them questions, anything that is important to you 
Assess whether it's in line with your personal values and with your career progression. See if it's a right fit. Then exit the interview as you entered with gratitude and respect. Shake their hand, tell them thank you for their time. It's a win-win situation no matter what the result, so don't get bummed if you don't get the job. You've had, uh, at the very least, interview experience and you've expanded your network. All right, so that's my attempt at cramming uh, 12 years of industry, industry experience in 45 minutes. If there's one thing that I'd like you to take from this entire talk, it's this. I see our life like a painting. The tools that you choose, the brush strokes you make, and the colors that you pick are like the stories we create. Family, friends, and uh, memories, careers, friendships, money, adventures. And this painting, just like our life story, is a work of art. When I started seeing life this way, it had a profound impact on the way that I lived my life. I started living more consciously and more deliberately. So, on your journey of creating and changing, allow that childlike spirit to continuously be curious. And remember that even though it may seem like it's all been done before, it hasn't been done by you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all.